This is 911. State your emergency. Hello? I can't help you if I don't know where you're at, honey. Where are you at? Where are you? I need as many units as I can get for Fairfield Road. Give me the numbers. 911, what's your emergency? Hey friends, it's Fletch from Vice President of Public Safety Solutions at 911 Inform. Welcome to this new podcast series, Off the Cuff, Confessions of an EMP. Brought to you by 911 Inform, delivering next generation 911 services for the enterprise today and making every second count. In this series, we're going to be talking to ENPs that have been on the job for years, as well as those brand new ENPs that have just passed the test. We'll dig in and have an in-depth conversation and find out what the ENP certification means to them. We'll talk about why they did it, what it means for their career, and what they did to pass the exam. Industry certifications are important to industry professionals, and the ENP certification is one that's admired by many in public safety. So join me as we find out exactly what makes an ENP tick in this Off the Cuff podcast series, Confessions of an ENP. Hey, it's Fletch. Welcome to this episode of Off the Cuff, True Confessions of an ENP. I'm Mark Fletcher, ENP, and we're sitting down with Keely Heyman, who's an ENP and the Executive Director of the Mountain Valley Emergency Communications Center right here in New Jersey. Good old Jersey girl. Welcome to the podcast, Keely. Well, thank you for having me, though you hunted me down a little, so. Yeah, well, you know, you were handed in by Jeremy DeMar, <laughs> so you were, you know, you were hung out to dry by him. I was. He just turned me right over to you. <laughs> we just met really for the first time, or just talked for the first time today. You are a total Jersey girl, and I love it. <laughs> I don't know if I should be offended or, you know, take that as a compliment. It goes both ways in Jersey. It really does. We are our own breed. <laughs> yeah, you are. But I think that's why we get along so well, because we both grew up in this crazy state. And that is for sure. That's like an understatement. Crazy is an understatement. <laughs> so Jeremy just bailed out after a year and said, OK, I'm going to go here. Keely, you run the center. See you. Bye. Yeah, that's what he did. What a great and, when, and when he watches this, I, I hope he understands I have abandonment issues now. I'm going to send him my therapy bill. <laughs> Well, see, he's lucky that you and I didn't know each other prior to this because we would have made his life, little Massachusetts boy, a living hell. I'm this. I'm I'm sad that this wasn't a thing beforehand because I could have used a couple of like just key points to get him. Yeah, no, there was so much that we talked about before that could never be recorded or publicly <laughs> played, which was just to me it was kind of like a relief. <laughs> oh, oh, I believe that. <laughs> We're here to talk about EMP. You just got your EMP. Um, I did. Recently. What what drove you to do that? So um, in the height of a pandemic, uh, I'm going to call it insanity. But uh, really, um, so the backstory a little bit on how I even became to know what Nina was. Um, one thing this state, and I'm sure you can probably attest to this, this state is notorious for giving us the just the dispatcher title. We are just dispatchers. We don't need to be anything else. And um, I had a captain at my former uh, jurisdiction who had kind of mentioned Nina to me a couple of times. Um, We're talking, this is back in the Stone Age where we were still slating things and punching cards uh, for incidents. And it was still really new in the state. Not a lot of people had talked about it. And he mentioned this uh, program ENP to me. I had no idea what it was at the time. I started researching it a little bit. And I had actually in circa 2010, I want to say 10 or 11, I had applied to take the ENP exam. Um, I ended up having a medical emergency and couldn't take the course. Um, so then I pushed it off and then I pushed it off again because, you know, life just threw everything at me. And then I had a baby and I thought I could do this when I have a newborn. <laughs> yeah, no, that didn't happen. So I kind of, it kind of got lost, um, over the next couple of years because there's no support um, really out there for us in sort of New Jersey, sort of in this this weird crux of, of life we are with dispatch and 911 because we always fall under a police department, almost always in New Jersey. And so trying to find the support to convince the training division of a police department that I need a certification such as ENP, which they're like, well, what does it even mean? They know nothing about it. They don't care to know. And so it was really hard to kind of stand on my soapbox there and 
tell them, hey, I need to go do this. Then fast forward, I came up here. Uh, I came up here because it's a regional center. Um, and that's rare. It's a rare entity here. Um, our county-based systems, the handful that we have here, they're great. Um, but New Jersey is not genuinely county anything. So, you know, this was a little bit different. This was modeled after Northwest Bergen a little bit. And I thought, what a great opportunity to go into this. And when I got here, the director here, he was, you know, doing it all by himself, how that man did it all by himself. I have no idea uh, because now I'm doing it all by myself. And thank God for Sarah, because I wouldn't be doing anything training without her. And um, so when Jeremy kind of got into place, it was sort of the moment where I could take a breath and take a step back. And he was like, go get your ENP. And I'm thinking to myself, are you out of your mind? We're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm going to try it. But I had no idea what to expect none. I, to this day, I will tell you of all the things that, um, when I was told that, you know, Fletch, Fletch was looking for me, I was like, of all the classes and of all the courses he wants to talk about, ENP's it, huh? Oh boy. <laughs> Cause I just, you know, it, it is like nothing else out there because you really do have to have a history in this field. You really do have to have an understanding of what Nina is, their expectations are, um, what, what their projects are that are out there in space. You have to know that that there's that knowledge base that it's kind of core to years of service and so I went and took it with one of my other dispatchers and he called me right after the test he took it like an hour before I did and he was like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got here you know it's uh so now you get, did you take it in person or did you? I did not. I was one of the first courses or first groups of people that went through it that took it virtually. Wow. How was that experience for you? So <laughs> violating. Um, <laughs> so I, you know, I was prepared that's, to go take. That's a great term. I've never <laughs> heard the term use violating for the exam, but <laughs> the first, the first for everything. It was so, it was so bizarre because, um, you kind of get to this point where they put everything on the screen and tell you what you need to do, like all your checkpoints. And there's like, don't have anything in your desk. Don't do this. Don't do that. No cell phone, no phone, no this. And I'm looking at my work desk, like, uh, how do I get rid of everything? And you only have so long to make that happen before this person comes into the room to check your area. And they make you take the camera and move the camera around your desk and under your desk and under your chair. And basically like, you know, down your shirt in your pockets, you know, I was like, <laughs> I was like, what is happening? Like I was totally not expecting that level of proctor to come in and be like, I wanna see everything. And they made me remove, um, obviously I have my work phone on top of my desk. They made me take that off of my desk and, and show them that it was off of my desk. It had to be completely empty, nothing around me. They checked everything. They even asked to check in my garbage can. So I had to take my garbage and show like it was the most bizarre thing I've ever gone through. And I have done virtual online training before. I have been through proctored tests before. That was nothing like I've ever experienced. And it was this person who was sitting in their house and all I heard was the, this child screaming in the background the entire time, that poor person. <laughs> so for the record, we don't look down your shirt. <laughs> That's the one place you didn't look. <laughs> You're such a Jersey girl. I love you to death. That's such a Jersey girl response. <laughs> it, it felt so true, though, you know. <laughs> now, that's, uh, that's, that's interesting. They actually did make me empty my pockets. Okay. Like, I had to stand up and empty my pockets if I had pockets. Well, you know, it's it all goes down to the validity of the test. And, uh, you know, the, the company that does that for us, Prometrics, is, is very specific about the authenticity of that test. And uh, at the end of the day, it just, it's something you should be proud of. I passed, right? Uh, I feel like when you finally got that, how long did it take for you to get your, your uh, pass fail? So that day, like right after the test, they give you like a preliminary okay. you passed type thing and you know jeremy's like that's great that's great that's great and i was like hold on 
not everybody's taken the test yet. That can change. Don't congratulate me yet. But I remember like looking at it and staring at it and not believing it. Genuinely not believing that I had just passed that test because it was so broad in knowledge. Like there was no specific thing you could study for, no specific thing that made it easy, no real um, one topic that was prevalent in the test. It was like, you just kind of had to know all all the things. And I remember thinking as it popped up on the screen, it was I, I don't even think it was maybe 10 minutes where you kind of got the email afterwards. It might've been 20 minutes, but I remember sitting there staring at it going, I don't believe that. I don't believe that yet. Nope. I'm going to wait until I get the official thing before I say anything. I, I almost didn't tell Jerry because <laughs> I was like, I don't, I want them to be like, Nope, have no idea yet. Uh, but that was very, um, I, I didn't believe it because of how broad it was. Hardest thing I've ever taken. It's a great feeling though, when you do get that. Yes. yes. Right. It's, it's just, it's that it's a level of excitement. I can't describe it, but people, people who have been there, they're like, it's just a thing when you get that, because it's not easy. You had to study hard and you know, it's a level of accomplishment that we don't get to feel all the time. What'd you do to study? What was your, your trick to, to get you up to speed on everything? Um, well, first I was handed, um, the stack of ENP books. Um, I was actually handled that by Bill Homer from Rave. Um, he was like, here's your alphabet soup. Good luck. (laughs) And I was like, Oh God, what am I getting myself into? And I got on a couple of study groups. Um, I believe the one was through mission critical. Um, and then there was another study group that was sort of through Nina. Um, it was like, people kind of got together and was like, Hey, we're we're getting this study group together. And so I, I went through those, um, I went through those books backwards and forwards. I had index cards spread out on my desk. I had, you know, you name it. I, I, there was a lot of different uh, variables and my coworker and I, we, kind of talk to each other about certain subjects because I was strong in some things and he was strong in some things. So we tried to put our brains together to meld them together and hope that we could make one brain out of what we were trying to do. Um, And we'd call each other with certain topics like, hey, did you read this? Does that make sense? And after we would be in those study groups together and afterwards we'd call each other and be like, "Um, help. (laughs) So that's sort of how we, we muddled through it, I guess. You know, it's interesting because I think you build relationships with the people that you're working with in your agency like you had, but other people around the country as well. Everybody's going through this same thing and feeling the same thing that you're feeling. And it's almost like a little mental health support group there. That is very true. That's what it ended up being between me and Billy because we were just, it was, we needed to lean on each other through that process. How do you feel that this helped your career? Um, you know, obviously, you know, when when Jeremy just leaves you raw and cold, you know, with no notice, <laughs> you know, you're kind of going to walk into that position. But do you feel like it helped you? It helped them make the decision that you were going to be his successor? So this is like a, a two part yes and no response. I think that it shows people that you have a background in this career path where many do not. Many people who come in, especially in New Jersey, this isn't considered a career path. This is considered a stepping stone to become a police officer, become a firefighter. And I know that's true in some parts of the nation as well, but especially here. Um, So nobody ever sets out saying, I'm going to be a 911 dispatcher when I grow up. And um, I think that it's while around here, it's not a well-known, I mean, I think there's only 12 of us, 13 of us in the state. There's not very many of us in the state of New Jersey. Um, So while around here um, for the people that are making decisions, they may not know what it is, but it shows that you have a level of dedication to this field that perhaps somebody else may not, somebody else doesn't have that knowledge base or that background, or even took the steps to go in that direction. So I think it both helped um, for that. Do I think that people in New Jersey necessarily know what it is or have been, have bumped into Nina or APCO or any of those? Um, It's, it's still kind of, it's floundering in this area, especially when you fall into a police department, 
you see it a lot more like Morris County. Those guys are great. They have, you know, they all sorts of training. They're always involved with Nina. Um, you see it at Union County. Um, but really, it's when you're in those police departments, um, they, it, it gets lost. So I think that it does give you that level of I took these steps to do this. I took these steps to be considered um, a subject matter expert. I took these steps to further my career and show you that I'm involved in 911 on a different level. I'm not just a dispatcher, you know, and I hate that sentence, but it's so true. It's so true, especially in these parts of the country. Up by me in Sussex County, it's like, is the corn done yet? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Those guys, they, they finally got a, a beautiful regional center and they're going through the same challenge everybody else is trying to get the towns to come on board because everybody is so home, home rule up here. This is my town. This is my police department. No. And, you know, I've got two call takers and 10 cops and one car on the road. But yep. boy, I'm going to answer my own 911 calls. Boy, I'm going to have, you know, just that one piece app because I have to have it. Yeah. And it, I think that's really where this that's where this EMP sort of comes in handy is because you can have these conversations and sort of be taken a little bit more seriously than you would if you're like, I have my my BC, my BTC certification. I, I'm an EMD, you know, like because that's all they know that that's it. Like when it comes to this space, especially here that's what they know. They're like, so you have certifications, so you're a dispatcher. And you're like, yeah, but I do something else. And I remember after posting it on my Facebook page, or maybe somebody saw it on my LinkedIn page, I don't remember. Uh, they messaged me, they text me, they're like, what does ENP mean? Why is it after your name? And it's again, somebody who's in public safety, but doesn't really know that much in the 911 space. So it was like nice to be able to be like, well, this is what it means and be able to send them the link like here, this is what it is and this is what it looks like. And this means that I know a little bit more than the average dispatcher. I know a little bit more than the average Joe that's in this career path. And this means that I take what I do seriously and that I'm I enjoy what I do, more importantly, because nobody would sit through that test unless you enjoy what you do. And you are just a dispatcher after all. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> Around here, you know you are. <laughs> That's okay. But you know what? It's that's that's just Jersey. Jersey is being Jersey and it's you know, people don't understand this state from many, many levels. And when you look at public safety in this state, it is such a political nightmare. All I don't even want to talk about it without getting in trouble, right? Right. Somebody will come and hunt us down and we'll be missing. I've already <laughs> said too much. <laughs> you and me both, and I've said I say it all the time. Like I don't want to say too much, but you know when you're working in these environments there's just a there's a sort of a game that has to be played because if you don't play it they'll run you out of dodge because it's jersey yeah yeah but but you know what it, it's all in all it's all harmless fun and uh yeah I tell you, it was the way i was brought up and, and the way i grew up and whatever but you know when i talk about it to other people they're like really <laughs> You guys did that? I'm like, yeah, we did. <laughs> yes, and none of us are in jail. Go figure. <laughs> well, you know that, that's the, the. I tell everybody the reason I'm not in jail is because the internet did not exist in 1980. That's a very valid point. I started my career when I was still doing reel to reel changes in the middle of the night for our audio tapes, and it's a good thing that there was that time where we had to rewind the tapes because the stuff that was on our radio systems at those hours. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it was so long ago for you in the in the 90s. <laughs> hey, it's longer than most people survive in this career. <laughs> no, that's, true. that's true. I'll give you credit for that. So what do you what do you think the ENP is going to do for you going forward in your career? I mean, is it going to change the way that you deal with employment in your center? So if there's something that it does do for me is it shows a little bit of the importance of training and expanding the knowledge of the people that you have on the floor. Um, don't make them just dispatchers. They are the end users. They are the people that are 
just buried in what they're doing, let them know that there's an entire world of 911. Because I feel like it gets lost. They dispatch and that's what they do. They dispatch. But at the end of the day, this career is expansive. It goes on forever. It goes on from, you know, CAD systems to vendors to that supply CAD systems to, you know, IT designs and cloud-based networks and phone systems. And it's just, it's expansive. And if you are given those opportunities or you are given the chance to take those people that are working in that environment and let them flourish and let them get the training and let them know that they mean more than being in just the dispatch center, we could expand this career just immensely because those are the people who use the systems. Those are the people who know how it works and know what can be done better. Because let's face it, when we first started 911, it was like, here's a cop on the desk, he answers the phone, or you get like a secretary and you're done. And we've we've made huge advancements since that. And just imagine what we could do if we take the people that are in that room and allow them to take tests like the EMP, let them go get certifications, let them go get training and let them really be involved in what they do and let them understand what they do. I think that's what it does for me is it gives me that advantage to be like, I have this and you guys can get this too. And you guys can know what you do and really understand the back work of what it takes to run a 911 center, to be involved in the 911 center, be involved in 911 and as, as it is. And I just think it's important that we have those conversations with our people, especially in this generation. These are, these are IT kids. These are, these are people who know what they're talking about when it comes to this techie stuff. We didn't come from that generation. We just kind of grew up through it and figured it out as we went. These guys grew up with it and they're the best advocates for the future in 911. Do you find from the center's perspective that you have better dispatchers because of their age being so young or do you do you have the your older dispatchers having problems with the technology so i think it's both um in this particular center we're not as um far gapped in generations as we were in my previous center but i don't think here we're having as much as the generational gaps um, that are being seen in a lot of the other centers, the old timers who were like, give me all the overtime and let me just go home. You have a whole new generation of people that are also in that room that are like, well, show me how it works. Show me what to do with it. Show me how to move on next. So I, while we see it here, we are very lucky that it's we're a little bit bridged um, between generations here. So it's not as obvious as I've seen it in other places. Um, But I do think that the older generation really doesn't have any interest in seeing how expansive this career could be. I think they're just, they're here for the money and they want to go, but the the younger ones are more like, what can I do with this? Can I make it more? And that's where I think it shifted a little bit. It shifted probably in, in like my range a little bit where it started to shift like, oh, there's more to do in this line of work than just push buttons and send people to things right like it does more than that so i think it's um we're seeing that bridge a little bit but i do have one or two that don't like it when we put new technology in but they get over it really quick because it's easy technology so i'm lucky in here but we had an old center of mine where we put in something new and you would have thought the world had melted down because <laughs> the older folks were like, nope, not having it. And all it was was a scheduling system. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, what do you mean? I don't have to write it down on a slip anymore. Well, you know, I mean, I think back, I remember going down to central Jersey for training on the Lear system and it was how to fill out the, the computer card, you know, for the incident and punch it in the time clock and i'm like oh my god (laughs) when i I first started we wrote things down in the blotter this big massive book and everything was handwritten in that book on shift off shift every incident and and then typed up on complaint forms and you know in addition to that and of course the dispatcher was the one that typed it all yeah no way we had a clipboard and we just, it was sat in between the two desks and we wrote down the incidents, the major incidents, because anything that was just a regular incident didn't have to go on that clipboard. But anything that was major that got a report number went on that fancy little clipboard. And then later on that night, we had to 
put it in into a nice pretty little package so you could turn that over to the press in the morning. Yep. <laughs> so. It was it was a different time then. Yes, it was. From a technology perspective, there's been a lot of advancements coming out, and you guys have have taken advantage of a lot of that. Uh, like Rapid SOS, for example, and that handset based location that's now coming in. How has that changed your job? You know, I remember years ago having a caller who called me and she had told me she was frantic. She told me she had been raped. She was frantic on the phone. The thing about it was, it was a phase one phone. I had no information. I had nothing. I didn't know where she was. I, nothing. And to this day, I still have no idea where that caller was. Um, her phone died. I tried to have it pinged. I, try, I tried everything I could possibly try. And we're talking, this is 15 years ago, 10 years ago, when phones first started coming out. And um, I had a generic location. I It was also a prepaid phone, which didn't help at all. Mm. And uh, it was just, I had nothing. And now... You know, I'm sitting on the floor on last Sunday. I was covering the desk, uh, you know, COVID. And uh, I was covering the desk and, you know, my rapid SOS comes up before the call has even hit the center. And I knew where that caller was. And it is just astounding to me how something almost so trivial and in idea has changed how we can get to those callers and, and get there quicker. Because even if... Even if I was able to locate that caller, it still would have taken me 20, 30 minutes to get through to the phone company to get it, you know, tracked, get it looked at, to have them ping the phone, to send the information to my email. Now it's like, it doesn't matter. It just shows up on my screen and I have a, a location, which is pretty crazy when you think about where we came from and where this all started and our screens in the beginning with phase one callers and you're kind of looking at the screen going, well, they could be in that area. I'm not really sure. And there was no maps. So like you were trying to figure out where this person was based on what little bit of information you had on that, at that alley screen. And now it's right there on a map and you can plot it. And, you know, it's incredible. We, we use um, what three words as well. And we've had a couple of incidences where people were in one of our reservations, had no idea where they were. And we sent the link to their phone and just, let gave that information to our first responder and they were able to walk right up to the person it's incredible where this would not have been a thing i just it's so much different now and we are getting out so much faster and we're processing information at warp speed at this point you know it's incredible so you so you still sit the desk and take 911 calls i do yeah i i am a working director providence new jersey <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Yes, don't do that. It's a bad plan. Yeah, uh, I, we, our previous, before Jeremy got here, our previous director did the same thing, especially with staff shortages. Um, we were okay, believe it or not, through the pandemic, we weren't in a terrible situation. Um, I had changed the schedule to allow the social distancing, but this uptick has taken them out, you know, and it's it's just continuing. So we're all just kind of, studying ourselves and hoping that we can get through my deputy director is on the desk today so wow now what were what was your deputy director doing prior to their promotion they uh jeremy had promoted her to the training qa qi coordinator um okay. so she had taken that over um so upon his departure i moved up and she just moved up into that slot she's still doing the same thing because she's really good at it she's really good at like she's got that training the training records down she the qa component we have that's another thing like that's another piece of technology there that is incredible where i mean back in the day and i'm sure you can attest to this nobody checked our calls unless there was inc an incident where they had to play it back you know unless somebody was complaining about you nobody was checking or nobody was checking for a standard there was no standards it was just just don't screw it up that was your standard and now to have this ability to have this qa component in there it took us from a whole agency of being at like an 80 percent and we're all at like 97 percent now because it's a standard everybody's doing the same thing everybody's handling the call processing the same everybody's checking for the same technology and information and mapping and all that so it makes a world of difference now that 
we have this standard, you know, and that's, that's what she's been focusing on is making sure that everything we do, no matter if I pick up the phone or if the newest person on the desk picks up the phone, it's done the same way. And that's a hard thing to get through, especially in our line of work, because, you know, you've got different agencies that want different things. They, you know, but the point is, as long as we are consistent, the information will remain consistent. My advice was, when I was up first on day shifts, the chief of police came out, cigarette hanging out of his mouth. He says, Fletcher, don't make my phone effing ring. <laughs> that sounds that was my about training. accurate. <laughs> that was my training. Okay, don't make I, my phone. I think mine was, good luck, don't eff it up. And that was it. Like, I had about, you know, two minutes of training. Uh, Betty, God rest her soul, she did an incredible job training me. Uh, I probably wouldn't still be here if it wasn't for her training, um, but... Uh, I don't know. I look back at that and wonder, why did I stay <laughs> after just being handed like basically that's the radio, that's the phone. Don't screw it up. <laughs> I yeah, that's what I got. I stayed for the pranks. That yeah, really- <laughs> that's just true. <laughs> Valid point for the for the laughter because if for nothing else, that's what we were doing. We were laughing. I, I gotta tell you, the the guys I worked with are the best practical jokers i have ever seen <laughs> in my i mean talking like squirrels in lockers i mean just <laughs> we had a police officer who crashed into the back of a car once because he was looking for a suspect so he didn't see the car in front of him it stopped they um decorated a an eclair and like put a little clown in the eclair like I, it was beautiful it was it was a masterpiece of pastry and <laughs> It was like, who comes up with this stuff? <laughs> yeah. Now there's there's so many stories that I would love to tell, but I can't. That's a whole other off the cuff episode for you. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 got to be an off the air episode. But it would be yes. a good one, though. It would be a yes. good. One. Well, listen, I really appreciate you sitting down with me. I am so pissed off at Jeremy. <laughs> Same for not getting me together with you a year ago. Well, we can definitely blame, you know, he's his his presence. He's always on social media. He just didn't have time for us, Mark. That's what it was. Well, let me tell you something. He, <laughs> between you and I now, he is going to pay dear. <laughs> he's going to see Good. a wrath of Jersey that has never been l- released before. You just let me know what you need me to do to help out. <laughs> I am going to have so much fun with you. <laughs> Anytime, you know that. And now I'm right here. So anything you need, I'm right here. I know you're you're probably 25 minutes away from me right here. That's yeah. the part. So I do want to come down. Next time I'm coming down, we're doing this in your center. Absolutely. Once this calms down a little bit. If it calms down, I've had it. Can we just be done? I think it will. <laughs> So, well, thanks for all your insights today. Thanks for what you do. Thanks for staying with this career as long as you have. You know, as a frequent flyer to 911, I don't try to be, but last year was not good. Uh, yeah. I appreciate everything I heard. That you guys do. Well, you know, we do it because we love it. There's no other reason. Yep. I, you know, I miss it. And this lets me maintain my sanity, but still keep in touch with it. So, it's okay to be on the outskirts. One day I intend on doing the same. <laughs> Keely Heyman, ENP, was the executive director at the Mountain Valley Emergency Communications Center. How many towns do you guys have under you? Uh, well, we've got three different jurisdictions, um, and the fourth jurisdiction is just fire EMS. Pretty good sized center. Looking forward to come, come seeing it one day. Thanks so much for sitting down with me. Anytime. Have a great day. Bye. Well, that wraps up this episode of Off the Cuff. Confessions of an ENP. I'm Mark Fletcher, ENP, and I'm the Vice President of Public Safety Solutions at 911 Inform. Off the Cuff is sponsored by 911 Inform, delivering next generation 911 solutions to the enterprise today and making every second count. Visit them on the web at 911inform.com. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter at Fletch911. Check out all my blogs and podcasts at Fletch.tv. And be sure to like and subscribe below. That way you'll be immediately notified whenever a new podcast is published. Thanks so much for listening. If you're in public safety, thanks for what you do. Take care and have a great day.